Hello, everyone, back again. So now I want to transition from statistical analysis of data into how do we get biology out of this? That's all the fun in doing these types of experiments. What lipidomics does is to help you really learn something about your cell or tissue or your disease. So this is a really fun thing to do. So I want to walk you through how do we translate measurements in lipidomics into systems way of thinking about a cell. Remember this, the cell does not discriminate between signaling, metabolism, transcription, and regulation and all these things. The cell functions as an integrated unit. It's a system, guys. So uh, we are going to deal with this as a system and see how we can really integrate some things. But I'm going to focus very heavily on lipids in my talk. I'm going to use one example. I'm going to take one cell, one mammalian cell. I'm using this mammalian cell as an example. I want to walk you through how measurements of lipids can give you insights, biological insights into this cell. So this is my, I mean, way of telling you how you can translate your own data into biological knowledge. I'm going to use an example. Examples are the best way to show how you can build a system's view of things. And so this is what I'm going to do. So what's the question? Cells integrate metabolism, signaling, metabolism, transcription, translation to produce phenotypes. Right, they do integration. Imagine you treat a liver cell hepatocyte with a drug. What it does is it metabolizes the drug, it processes the drug, but it sends it through a signal. The drug essentially may bind to a receptor, may activate some pathways. The signaling ends up in sending some transcription factors into the nucleus. Then it activates transcription. The transcription in turn produces your transcript genes. And these genes that are synthesized in turn get translated into proteins and then function to produce phenotypes, right? Very simple view. So how do we do, how do we really understand this from a lipid world perspective? How is metabolism in mammalian cell affected by perturbation? This is the first question we ask. I mean, our goal is, you know, you always do pairwise conditions. For example, you take uh, blood samples at two different times, uh, fasting blood sugar and postprandial blood sugar, for example, or blood sugar between for a person at two different blood sample at two different times today and a month from now, you want to look at what is the metabolic concept, what are the metabolic concentrations in this patient across. You always do a perturbation. Perturbation can be treatment or time or what, what it is. Our question is: how is metabolism affected by this perturbation? How does it change? You're done lipids, so you want to measure how these lipids change. What mechanisms are activated in metabolic remodeling of the cell? What mechanisms are changed? How does this changes in lipid composition, for example, alter very fundamental, very interesting question. How does metabolism affect a pharmacological perturbation? Imagine I have an infection and then now I take a drug on top of that infection. Now is it going to, is the drug going to alter the metabolism that was already affected by my infection? Can systems biology approaches provide a quantitative framework for understanding? It's all fun to say that, okay, great, you know, I have increased in this metabolite or that metabolite. But what does it mean quantitatively? How does it translate quantitatively? This is what I'm going to address in today's lecture. I hope you will take away from here a message that uh, systems biology is the ultimate goal. It's like the holy grail where you really ask the question, how does the cell function? It is okay to know how many lipids are changing. It's also good to know how lipids are changing, but you also want to know how does the change in the lipid affect your cell? This is what we are going to do. The cell I'm going to focus on as an example today is called the macrophage cell. The macrophage cell, many of you know, is the first cell of immune response. It is an innate immune response cell. Um, it is um, essentially anytime you have an infection, a bacteria E. coli, this is in the orange stuff is E. coli. E. coli binds to receptors on this macrophage cell. And the receptors, uh, they buy, the receptor is called a TLR4 receptor. The TOL4 receptor activates uh, a signaling cascade involving a protein called MyD88. And then this in turn activates a number of processes, including something called NF kappa B, which in turn goes to the nucleus. It's a transcription factor, binds inside, activates gene transcription, et cetera. But then there's a component of lipids. How do the lipids change? So this is what we are going to focus on in today's lecture for the large part. So the many, many papers we have published in this area. So I'm going to just leave this for you to go and look at any of these papers that you're interested in, which provides a view of systems view of the macrophage lipidome. 
What's the experiment? The experiment is simple. The question is, how do macrophages remodel lipids in response to stimulus, in response to infection? In fact, we are going to look at infection. The macrophages are primary cultured cells. We use primary cells, we use cultured cells. The treatment is, you know, the thing in E. coli that really binds to your macrophage is called lipopolysaccharide. And the active part of lipopolysaccharide is a lipid called KLO2, uh, K -K I mean, uh, KDO2 lipid A. We abbreviated as KLA. This is the active component of LPS, which tells the cell, hey, you're being infected, you're being attacked and start doing changes and start producing a response. And you know that innate immune response produces, uh, I mean, cytokines and cytokines, and it also produces uh, uh, secondary immunity, cellular immunity at some level. We also do treatment with compact in the statin drug. I asked you pharmacologically what happens. So I'm going to show you with the statin drug. An activating molecule called ATP, I won't have time to tell you about ATP or cholesterol, but those papers I presented to you have some of that you can go and look at. The thing we sample is blood plasma. This is all experiments in the murine systems and mice. So the thing we, we also look at human blood plasma, but I won't have time to tell you about human blood plasma. What measurements do you make? The measurements we make are mass spectrometric measurements on lipid changes. For the last two days plus, you have heard nothing but various mass spectrometric methods. Today, I'm going to use that, but we are going to do a time series. We're going to monitor after the infection happens as a function of longitudinally, as a function of time, we want to ask what happens to the lipid changes in the cell. We also do gene array measurements to look at what happens to the transcription, transcriptome of these cells. We do protein measurements using eye tract mass spectrometry and immunoassay to see how the proteins change. Then we do specialized experiments. Then we bring all these together to build a systems view of what the macrophage does. I hope to give you an example of how we take the lipids and do it. So this is a mouse, this is a peritoneal macrophage, this is a thioglycolate elicited macrophage, bone marrow derived macrophage, this is a cell line derived from this macrophage, like a tumor. You know, we do all of these, we in fact have done experiments with all of these different things. And they all do innate, inf they do inflammation, innate immunity. What about the mass spec methods? Boy, you have learned so much about mass spec in the last two days that you now know what I'm talking about. You can, have, if you want to look at each of these different lipids, you have to use a slightly different mass spec method. For example, fatty acids, the best mass spec method is GCMS. And what about icosinoids? The best mass spec method is LCMS, ESI Q trap method. What about glycerophospholipids, LCMS, et cetera? So you can do all these different methods. This is what my collaborators did. We had a very large consortium grant. So they did all these different methods. And I give you present, we present these methods in a big volume of uh, methods in enzymology, which has multiple chapters on how to do this mass spectrometry correctly. What did we find? I'm gonna walk you straight into what we found. So when you take treat a macrophage cell with uh, the inflammatory stimulus, which is the lipopolysaccharide or KDO2 lipid A, KLA, we see that 49 fatty acids are differentially regulated it's between control and infected. 25 sterol esters are differentially, highly differentially regulated. 14, by now you know, these all have significant p-values. So how do I know they are important? This is all the pair, the p-value differences, which means that these are all significantly differentially regulated. 161 glycerophospholipids, 77 glycerolipids, A63 sphingolipids, and 11 icosides. How do you do this? All of them go through this process. Essentially, my treatment is it produces fatty acid synthesis which is also converts fatty acids back by beta oxidation to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is involved, also comes from proteins and uh, carbohydrates. You know this well in the glycolysis in the machinery in mitochondria, goes into fatty acids, remodels into icosinoids, sterol esters, sterols, glycerophospholipids. But I'll tell you all about it. The most interesting thing was across time, across from zero to 24 hours, icosinoids responded very beginning, very early, then came sterols, then came sphingolipids, then came glycerophospholipids, and then finally came glycerolipids. So there's kind of a remodeling order in these. And this was the inflammatory response at a, at a bird's eye view at a high level. I will now dive deep into telling you to systems biology. To give you an example, I told you icosinoids came first, prostaglandin E2 and icosinoid. You see this? Prostaglandin E2 is one of the early responders I mean, a, a, arachidonic acid is a precursor for prostaglandins. That's the first responder, the red line here. 
I mean, then comes your cholesterols gradually increasing, et cetera. So these are typical kinetic plots or temporal plots of time course data. This is a very interesting pathway that we generated by looking at all the changes. So this is your lipopolysaccharide treatment. It activates through TLR4 pathway, goes through this uh, PI3 kinase pathway, goes through the glycerophosphate phospholipase pathway, produces arachidonic acid, which gives rise to all these wonderful uh, different, uh, I mean, uh, icosanoid categories. Then it gives rise to various uh, sterols, cholesterol and other sterols, gives rise to sphingolipids and so forth. This is a very complex, interesting network. I'm going to show it to even more complex form in a minute. When we mapped it all to all the genes and the whole pathway, this small blurb here, you see here, when we mapped each of these icosanoids, for example, is this, fatty acids is this whole guy, sterols is this whole guy, glycerophospholipids. I don't want you to read into every single, this is published in JBC. What I want you to take away from here is that we can build these networks with the combination of both lipids and the lipid genes that activate these pathways. In fact, the heat maps that you are seeing or pre-infection and post-infection as a function of time. Long, I mean, if you go horizontally across, it is time. If you go top row is untreated and bottom, I'm sorry, top row is treated, bottom row is untreated. And that's how we want to read this plot. So you can see the gross changes across all the lipids that are changing. So one never knew before that uh, your infection produces a macrophage response that causes all these lipids to undergo changes. If you take any one of these, for example, I want to project these sterols, just very sterols, but just this guy in the middle, if I take it and project it out, is what it looks like. Uh, many of you know the sterol biosynthetic pathway. There are two different routes by which sterol is biosynthesis, biosynthesis are metabolized. HMG-CoA is a precursor, which gives mavalonic acid and which gives squalene Squalene gives epoxide, goes into two possible ways. One is through the standard uh, pathway, lenosterol, cholesterol, desmosterol, cholesterol. The other is through the Russell path, Kandrush pathway. Uh, and that goes through the epoxy pathway, epoxy sterols, et cetera. And these guys are very important because they are also act as ligands for a transcription factor. I'll show you as I go along. Now we published this lipid remodeling of these macrophages in terms of saying, how do these lipids get remodeled? I'm going to walk you through how do these lipids get remodeled. So this is, imagine this is your cell. This is your cartoon view of the cell. Here's your fatty acid, arachidonic acid is coming in because activation by lipopolysaccharide or KLA activates arachidonic acid through this uh, transporter called FAT. And so this produces fatty acids. So your starting point here is fatty acid. You saw that because in arachidonic acid plot was the biggest plot highest amount to begin with. How does it get remodeled? First thing it does is it, it uh, can get converted into acyl-CoA, fatty acids into fatty acyl coenzyme. And so these fatty acyl coenzymes, uh, fatty acyl coas go into, acyl coas go into mitochondria. This is all mitochondria stuff. It goes into, converts energy metabolism, it gets converted into you know, the thing that transports acyl-CoA into mitochondria is, is carnitine palmitoyl transferase. It then gets processed and then gets processed into, uh, I mean, uh, uh, citric acid, I'll tell you in a minute, and produces acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA gives rise to all the sterols, has a pretty much finger lipids. Fatty acids also remodel using lipases and PLA into glycerolipids and glycerophospholipids. We measure all these guys, so you can look at what happens in a minute. So the fatty acids, according to based on the data measurements, I'll show you in just a minute the data, you can show that the fatty acids remodel into acyl coas acyl coas then give rise to synthesis of sphingolipids and cholesterol esters and cholesterols and glycerophospholipids. And they also get remodeled, these get remodeled back into fatty acids using lipases. And this is a complete picture of what happens in lipid metabolism in an infected macrophage cell. I'll give you a specific example. What we surprisingly discovered was that uh, when you looked at this CoAs, I remember I told you about CoAs. When you looked at CoA, this is the unsat, this is a saturated CoA, 16 colon zero. 
16 colon 1 is the unsaturated CoA. Every time this blue is treated and red is untreated, in the, the unsaturated values, I'm sorry, the saturated values always went up in every single case, unsaturated values all went down in these cases. So the lipid is getting remodeled. Why is it increasing in saturated coase and not in unsaturated coase? And what are the consequences? Again, second coA, if you look at, for example, coA 18 colon zero, saturated coA, high up in the treatment, 18 colon one, one double bond, lower in treatment, two double bonds, lower in treatment. So karyolipidate treatment results in a significant decrease in unsaturated fatty acyl coas as a function of time. So why is it getting changed? Same thing is happening with cholesterol esters. If you're cholesterol esters, look, this is unsaturated. This is saturated, 14 colon zero cholesterol ester. If you go to one unsaturated, mono unsaturated, 14 colon one goes down. 16 colon zero, same thing. 16 colon two, even more down from 16 colon one. Same thing with 18 colon zero, one. Why is, what's happening? So we then looked at, um, I'll give you one more uh, example, then I'll come back to telling you about it. The same thing happens with phosphatidylcholines. Saturated, high, unsaturated goes down. Saturated, high, unsaturated goes down. So you can take the measurements that you get, standardize or normalize them. You can compare them across these different, uh, I mean, the time courses in, at, this is 24 hours, time course experiment across for all the classes of lipids, like saturated, unsaturated. Beautiful, right? Gives you an idea about how these lipids are getting remodeled in your cell. How are they getting remodeled? They're getting remodeled because the enzyme that converts the saturated lipid into unsaturated lipid, these are called desaturases. All the desaturases, the fatty acid desaturase, steroid CoA desaturase, they are all down as a function of time. Now I'm telling you systems biology because the down regulation of the enzymes, that means they don't produce the enzymes. The genes are down regulated, they don't produce the enzymes. So the enzymes are not present to convert the saturated lipids into unsaturated lipids. As a consequence, you have what I showed you before. Okay, so what is the remodeling hypothesis? So KLA mediated activation of TLR4 receptor in macrophage cells, down regulates fatty acid desaturase transcription. Why does it do it? I'll show you in a minute. Resulting in reduced levels of unsaturated acyl CoA, and then makes downstream changes in amounts of saturated versus unsaturated in every lipid category. And why is it down regulated? Down regulated because TLR4 essentially activate, is activated through this uh, transcription factors called PPR alpha, LXR. And they in turn reduce the levels of desaturases. If desaturated saturates is present, it converts into unsaturated fatty acids. If desaturates is not present in high abundance, it does not convert it, which is what we are seeing. What's the consequence? We'll see in a few minutes. So that's the first story, which is essentially all of the unsaturated fatty acid levels goes up upon infection. What about sterols and other things? Absolutely. In fact, the sterols are upregulated. We saw there was a function of time, and which means that your, your mitochondrial metabolism pushes it towards producing acetyl-CoA, which comes out extruded. It's extruded into the cytosol to produce uh, acetyl-CoA and HMG-CoA. So this is a complete picture of remodeling. Acyl-CoA is increased here, which causes all these changes. Acetyl-CoA is increased here, which causes all these changes. And these are all modified by these enzymes and transporters, which push cholesterol in and out of cell. This is a beautiful picture of what happens in a macrophage cell. What about a pharmacological perturbation? So let's say I have an infection and I have increased production of sterols. Imagine I want to reduce the production of sterol. What do I do? I block the sterol production. So we can do a pharmacological perturbation. We published a few papers on this pharmacological perturbation. So it's, it gives us a very good idea of systems way of thinking about crosstalk between metabolism and transcription. How does this crosstalk happen? A very simple story. I'm gonna give you a canonical view of what happens in this pathway, statins. What do statins do? In fact, a sizable population of uh, patients take uh, statin drugs 
whether they're obese or whether it's metabolic syndrome, statins are common drug that are given. How does it work? Essentially, what it does is it takes HMG-CoA, it blocks a step where HMG-CoA is converted into mevalonic acid. If you don't have mevalonic acid, you don't go downstream and produce sterols. So you stop right here and you essentially block the step, which means you don't produce excess cholesterol. This is what the statins do. It's good and bad. I want to show you something very interesting in the story that we discovered in our study as a consequence of measuring lipids. So you would expect when you use HMG-CoA cholesterol, all the sterols will be blocked. Absolutely correct. In fact, we sh I'll show you measurements where the sterol levels are down-regulated. But we found something very surprising too, and this is why systems biology is very important. And what this pathway does is that this pathway has two ways of going. I showed you two arms of this pathway. These guys, which are epoxy, lanosterol and epoxy cholesterol, they are ligands for these receptors called LXR receptors. And LXR is a transcription factor which activates these genes which push cholesterol out. ABCA1 and ABCG1 are cholesterol transporters. So these kinds of guys get upregulated normally when these act on this. Now let's see what happens in our study. So you expect, uh, I mean, you expect cholesterols to be down, absolutely the case. But what you don't expect is prostaglandins to go up because prostaglandins don't automatically get converted into sterols. There's no, there's no mechanism, lipid mechanism by which you can go from icosanoids to sterols directly. No mechanism, there's no mechanism at all. They are two completely independent arms of your lipid pathways. Why is your prostaglandin increasing? And why is it bad? It's bad because prostaglandin is a pain modulator or pain mediator. So you feel pain, you know? So prostaglandin D2 and E2 cause pain and inflammation. And they go up. Why are they going up when you treat with statins and they infect itself? So we asked this question. So we then looked at each of these LXR. And said, this is where the beautiful story comes into picture. These LXR gets activated more when we block this. So we asked the question, what happens to this blocking thing? So when we block this, these are the targets of LXR targets. And you can see that LXR has these uh, transcription factor binding sites. And all of these sites are, uh, I mean, repeats. And they're all found, in fact, they are all found in uh, near the COX-2, which is the gene for the uh, for all the icosanoids for many of these things, the promoter region for that. This pregative LXR E, LXR regulates COX2, which in turn alters expression of cytokines and so forth. As a consequence, you are getting essentially, this is located at binding position minus 210 and minus 401 in your chromosome. And so as a consequence, COX2 gene is affected through LXR altered state. So this is a crosstalk how lipids remodel your cell behavior and your cell phenotype. There are many examples you'll come across. I'm going to give you one more. I'm not going to give you the example, but I'm going to tell you to think about it. For example, you look at uh, all your histone acetylation and histone methylation, histone deacetylation, which is all the modifications of histones, which is chromatin modifications. They are all metabolic changes and metabolism is altered because of changes in your acetyl transfer, histone acetyl transferase and your moiety substrate, which can transfer your acetyl group. So this is why there's a strong connection between lipids and transcript, transcriptome. And you've got to really think hard about a system's way of looking at it. Now I want to walk you for the next 15 minutes or so, I'll walk you through remodeling and quantitative modeling or how you think about metabolism in a more quantitative way. Just give it a think about it for a second. When you have a lipid, for example, arachidonic acid, which is breaking down into various lipids, there's a flux of the lipids. What do you mean by flux? That means as a function of time, you're going to change the values. Every substrate is converted to a product. The product then becomes a substrate gets converted to the next product, that becomes a substrate, get converted to the next product, et cetera. You have a cascade of changes. This is a flux of changes. When we measure these lipids as a function of time, we measure at one hour, two hours, four hours, or half an hour, one hour, two hours, four hours, six hours, et cetera. We are really measuring how the metabolites, how the lipids are fluxing through your cell. 
So we want to get a quantitative view to know what is the kinetics of this fluxing? How does it affect your cell phenotype, right? So this is what you're really interested in understanding. This is a quantitative systems way of looking at lipidomics, time series measurements. Okay, so let me walk you through this. I already showed you, for example, when you treat with the lipopolysaccharide, which is, uh, which is an E. coli ligand that binds to macrophage, I told you there's remodeling of all these lipids. I'm going to focus only on one remodeling, one lipid class remodeling, which is icosanoids. Icosanoids are prostaglandins, thromboxanes, uh, and, uh, and heat molecules. And I'm going to focus only on those. And so I'm going to focus on just these. And this remodeling is activated through a complex signaling pathway involving ERK, uh, estrogen receptor kinase, and then this models into uh, changes COX-2, then which in turn alters all these other, uh, uh, the enzymes are changed, enzyme levels change, the lipid levels. So I'm going to walk you through quantitative measurements. So the red arrow represents a signaling pathway. The black arrow represents a metabolic pathway. For example, conversion of arachidonic acid into PGH2, into PGH2, into PGE2, etc. And then the enzymes are representing by circles or, or uh, these kinds of ellipses. The rectangles are unmeasured analytes. We don't measure all of them. Measured analytes are given by hot, by solid lines. So this is, there are two branches to this that I told you. One is uh, this left branch, and this is the right branch. I'm representing them again. This is the prostaglandin branch. This is the leukotriene branch. And so I'm going to treat them as being two separate branches of this uh, pathway. So essentially your arachidonic acid goes into these two branches. What do prostaglandins do? Prostaglandins mediate pain and inflammation. In fact, what, when you take uh, ibuprofen, Advil, what it does is it essentially blocks your COX receptor, your COX is an enzyme, it blocks an enzyme. So it doesn't produce prostaglandins. In fact, this is, so you may not know this, but this is exactly what happens. So prostaglandins mediate pain and inflammation. Your pain is resolved because the mediators of pain are blocked. COX is cyclooxygenase. It's also called prostaglandin synthase one and two. They are targets for all these molecules, all these drugs you take like aspirin, ibuprofen, Advil, etc. So we also can ask the question, hey, should patient take um, one type of, I mean, uh, one type of medication, PTGS1 blocker or PTGS2 blocker? Very interesting question, right? So we can ask the question. So when you look at measurements of all the lipids, this is a, the KLA treatment. This is also with ATP. I'm not going to go into this. And essentially, you are increasing many of these lipids. That's what I told you, showed you before. Many of these lipids, pain mediators get increased. So I want to do a kinetic model of this. I want to do a flux model. What do I want to do? What, what, what am I interested in? I'm interested in knowing from a quantitative systems biology perspective, I want to know, if, imagine you're doing in your lab measurements of time series of a given treatment or a condition. You want to look at the kinetics. You want to look at what happens to say two days from now or three days from now. You want to look at the kinetics. You want to model the kinetics. Very easy to do that. In fact, this is what people do. You must have studied in your, um, in your physical chemistry or biochemistry, things like michaelis menten mechanism for remodeling, first order kinetics, second order kinetics, et cetera. We can model these as kinetics. What does it mean? It means you're balancing mass. You're not going to see, you're not going to create or produce or destroy something. You're essentially balancing mass, which means that if you start with arachidonic acid, it goes down to prostaglandin. The sum of all these things, the total number of uh, total weight of all these things, total mass of all these things has to be conserved. Otherwise you are creating something out of nothing. So that's what is called mass balance. So we can walk through these uh, complex pathways and try to create a mass balance, which means that you really write, write equations which tell you how A is remodeling into B and B is remodeling into C, et cetera. For example, if I start from here, it can tell me how would this dihedrose fingosine goes into dihedrose ceramide, dihedrose ceramide goes into dihedrose fingomyelin, dihedrose fingomyelin goes into lyso dihedrose fingomyelin, et cetera. I want to walk through this time cascade for each of these paths. I can model it using kinetics. I'm going to measure them. I'm going to measure it at this time, at the next time, at the next time, at the next time. So I have a time series data. So I know the flux. 
For example, this may decrease with time. If it decreases the time, I know this is getting converted into this. This may increase with time. That means I'm going to say this is going to convert into this, but this is not going down further into this or this or something, right? So this is called kinetic modeling and it's a part of systems biology approaches. And you may use it in your lab to study changes in metabolites. How do you, what do we know in the measurements? So this is what is nice about lipidomics measurements because in lipidomics, if this is your equation for the metabolite change, the flux of the metabolite, we are measuring at different time points. We know the values of these metabolites at different time points. We know the rate change because if I know it goes for, imagine, remember the curve I draw, I showed you that goes from time one to time two to time three. I know the rate of change. So I can get the rate expression by simply measuring y2 minus y1 by x2 minus x1. That's the slope of the line. The slope gives me the rate at any given time point, right? So I can get the slopes. I can know that this is known because I'm doing time series measurements. This is known because I'm measuring the metabolites at different times. What I don't know is the rate constant. So if you go back here, I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. I don't know this guy. K is all the Ks, but I know the Xs. And I know how the Xs are changing. I know X and DX by DT, but I don't know the rate constants, right? So I can make the rate constant measurements. I can, I mean, get the rate constants by inverting this problem. And this, my flux is nothing but uh, the product of my, uh, I mean, matrix of my known lipid concentrations times the rate constant, right? That's your, my equation here. And so I can get these guys because I know these, I know these, I don't know them. So I can measure them. And this is what the people do in systems biology, kinetics experiments. So for example, if I take this Cox pathway, this is cyclooxygenase, I mean, pathway. And if I go through this Cox pathway, and then I go through, I mean, prostaglandin synthase one, two, et cetera. I can go into, I produce each of these uh, um, uh, products and this is the enzyme that produces it. I can measure it every time these values. And this is my equation for measuring it. For example, the flux for the reference rate with reference to C1 <coughs> is nothing but where PTGS1 converts arachidonic acid. This step to this step is my first step. That's my first step. Right, so it's a, it's a essentially it's reaction involving second order, or it can be pseudo second order, first order if you want, because PTGS1 may be an enzyme, maybe a Michaelis Benton if you want, to give me my rate constant and give me my rate expression. I can write such a rate expression for every single reaction. I can then go and same thing with reference to LOX, lipooxygenase pathway. This is a cyclooxygenase pathway, lipooxygenase pathway. I can write all the leukotrienes. I can write same rate expressions. I can generate ordinary differential equations according to law of mass action. This is not law, this is law of mass action. And then I can then solve these equations. These are the computers do these guys for you. I will point you to, in my papers, I point you to modeling mechanisms and methods and they are all publicly available. So you can take your data and try to model it using mass action kinetics and you end up getting curves. In fact, if you do that uh, modeling with reducing those rate constants, this is what I cosmetics look like PGD2. What is in, um, uh, in your circles is your experimental data with standard deviations. The red curve here is the comp computed is based on the kinetic model fluxing. You can see how really good is this model based on the way you can measure time series data. What do we, first thing, I want to give you two small lessons from here. Number one, the more time series you measure, the better your curve is going to be, the better your model is going to be. The less time series you measure, if you have bumps like this, for example, this time series will not be able to, your kinetic modeling will not account for this really very well. So we get a bump, the bump may or may not be real. So the more fine grained your data time series is, the better off you are in terms of doing this modeling. What can you learn from this modeling? So let's look at two different pathways. Let's look at COX derived prostaglandin H2, COX1 derived and COX2 derived. In fact, uh, there are drugs that are specific to COX1, drugs that are spe specific to COX2. These are called NSAIDs, uh, non-steroid inflammatory drugs. And so therefore uh, we can use those drugs to look at is COX1 preferred or COX2 preferred for producing your output. You can look, the kinetics are different between these two enzymes. So if you look at the flux distributions, you see right away 
from here PGD2S no preference. You can see PGD2S really no preference to between uh, COX1 and COX2, whereas PGH2, uh, PGE2 has a preference between COX1 and COX2. You can see that these are right on the ground level. This is significant. And so in fact, experimentally, this is true. Uh, arachidonic acid production with the PGE2, if it's measured experimentally in uh, human cells, and you show that there's a difference between these two inhibitors. So which drugs you can give. So it's a good way of looking at the quantitative estimates of which enzyme. I want to go back here and tell you, we have, we have COX-1 and COX-2. You, both of them produce, both of them produce the same product, but with different kinetics. So you can look at which kinetics activated, which kinetics is not activated. This is especially significant if you can trace down the metabolic difference and look at the relative ratios of these different enzyme products. For example, I can look at the relative ratios uh, with the primed inhibition of COX-1 and the inhibition of COX-2. I can look at a comparison. This is a non-selective inhibitor, PG, the inhibitor of, uh, first inhibitor that I looked at. This is a COX-2 specific inhibitor. COX-1, there's no selectivity. COX-2 it is specific. And thromboxane, COX, it's COX-1 specific inhibitor. So we can look at uh, these different inhibitions and pharmacologists do this all the time because they want to look at drug differences. Okay, so we can also do measure, look at the time scale decomposition. Imagine in a, in a kinetic systems biology experiment when you have metabolic flux. I mean, we can do this with flux for a long time period too. So we want to look at what takes, what happens quickly, what happens medium term, what happens slowly. So this is called time scale decomposition. We can do decomposition of time scales. And then say that the fast thing is PGH2, for example, medium time frame, you have arachidonic acid, PGD2, and heat, and slow time frame, 50 hour time scale, time constant, you have these guys. So this gives us an idea of really, if you look at uh, other situations where you have, to, you imagine you're treating a diabetes patient with the drugs, you can look at the metabolic remodeling and look at what time scales are you addressing when do you expect to see metabolic changes in a patient uh, metabolite sample, you know, in a glucose metabolism or, li or, or lipid metabolism, oxidative metabolism? When do you expect to see the changes? It's really a beautiful way of using systems biology and lipid measurements to arrive at your flux changes. Okay, so this is done by what done by a lot of people. I just wanted to give you uh, give credit to them. I'm going to post these lecture notes on the website. You're most welcome to peruse this. Let me summarize what I'm trying to tell you here in system biology. What does system biology do? I can talk to you for a five days on work that is in, involves lipids and system biology, but I want to give you a bird's eye view. What am I trying to do? I will stop sharing and give you a bird's eye view. The bird's eye view I want to give you, leave you with is the following. When I do lipid measurements, my goal is to convert the lipid measurements into mechanisms that can help me figure out cellular phenotypes this or tissue phenotypes or disease phenotypes. That's my goal. So if I want to measure these, predict these phenotypes, I have to derive the mechanisms. So I take my lipid measurements and you need either for a time series or you need to measure for a large number of patients or large number of people. So you can have a way of comparing. So then I ask the question, I have control, I have disease, I want to do a comparison. I want to build a mechanistic view of how my lipid changes can be translated into pathways, into phenotypes, et cetera. I gave you one example towards the very end of my presentation, last part of the presentation. You, cannot, you don't need to stop at just simply providing a qualitative mechanism. You can provide a quantitative view of this mechanism by measuring fluxes, because you're measuring fluxes as a function of time, and if you're measuring the metabolite concentration as a function of time, you can invert the problem to getting rate constants and look at fluxes and predict in the future what is going to be the value of a given metabolite in your physiology. These are extremely useful systems biology approaches towards deciphering how lipids and lipid metabolism plays a role in normal and pathological conditions in humans. I didn't have a chance to tell you exactly how proteomics, how the lipids in turn affect proteomics and signaling. I didn't have time to tell you how lipids remodel histones and chromatin changes. I didn't have time to tell you, but there are this, hopefully this will give you an idea 
how to start viewing these new papers that are emerging in literature in terms of trying to understand lipidomics from a systems level perspective. Okay, good luck with that. Again, if you have questions or if you want to communicate any questions, please use my email, my first name, Shankar at S-H-A-N-K-A-R at UCSD, University of California, San Diego .edu. I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you have. Uh, I hope you get take away from this uh, two lectures that uh, lipidomics is a fantastic tool and resource. And once you measure these lipids, you can do them as a function of time, function of treatment, function of various conditions, features. And the analysis of these will provide you a rich insight into the mechanisms that control cellular tissue, organ, and species, human species, disease, non-disease behavior. And if you, if you take away that message and continue to do exciting lipidomics measurements, we would have accomplished our goal of the summer school lectures. Okay, do stay in touch. Good luck with the rest of the lectures. You're going to hear more about statistics and you're going to hear more about tools, um, Lion Web and other tools that will be immensely useful to you along with the metabolomics workbench tools for you to do analysis of your lipidomics data. Okay, good luck to all of you and thank you for your attention.